Thank you for including dentistry and mouths in your day today. It's a real honor to be here. And you've no idea the amount of times I've attended kind of some training days like this and they talk about multidisciplinary care and teeth are nowhere to be seen or mouths are nowhere to be seen. So I think it's so important and to steal Raj your analogy from earlier about if you have a problem with your boiler, you call your dentist, but it's still your house. I think probably, unfortunately, a lot of GPs think their mouths are also your house too. And there's so much scope for us to work together for our patients. Um, so I'm Christina, as you said, I'm a general dentist and I work in Plymouth. I'd like to talk to you today um, about why oral health is important, especially to the group of people that we're treating, why dentists need to be trauma informed and what I feel that looks like. So um, as we can see here, this definition of oral health encompasses so much more than just toothache and you know, teeth and gums. It does also includes the um, importance of being able to convey a range of facial expressions and emotions with confidence. And I think that's a really key word here. Um, it won't surprise anyone that oral diseases are n negatively associated with health-related quality of life, but also psychosocial factors play a huge part in this. And in a study of, it was in Scottish prisoners, I believe, their oral appearance really affected their self-esteem and their ability to interact with other people. And from the patients that I see and treat, it, the shame and the fear of judgment that they feel is so much more of an issue for them sometimes than the toothache and the pain. I've had sort of a, a young 20-year-old um, man who has retained his upper four front teeth for two years despite suffering recurrent abscesses, pain every day with them because he didn't, he could have them out, but there was no option for him to have them replaced in the, the system we have at the moment in Plymouth. Um, and he'd live with that because he didn't want them out. He didn't want to have no front teeth. And I think, who can blame him, really, when we think that? Um, so we all make judgments about how people look, whether we then go on to challenge them or not. This gentleman is under 50, um, and how might people think if he went for a, a job interview or something like that? And then, you know, it, it's so much more than teeth. It affects the whole of someone's face, how they look, and how they present and feel about themselves. And again, I expect... Sadly, many of you are used to seeing patients that look quite like this woman. Again, this lady is under 40. And, you know, she sat there and said this in the chair after she'd had her dent dentures fitted. And I was sort of like, quick, let me get a pen and write this down because this is amazing. Um, and she very, I'm very grateful to these patients for letting me share their photos today. So as I said, I'm from Plymouth, and I'm sure like most towns in the UK, and certainly Manchester, we have this map of deprivation across the city. Some of the areas in Plymouth are in the um, sort of 2% highest deprivation, and I work smack bang in the middle of that dark red area. So I work with people who've suffered homelessness, um, addiction, mental illness, domestic abuse, I work with women who've had children removed, and often a mixture of all of these issues. In the company that I work for, we also have a looked after children's clinic and an asylum seekers and refugee clinic. Um, so why do dentists need to be trauma informed? Um, and I expect most people can answer that, but there's, there's sort of two factors and one is what's happened to that person in their life and maybe what dentistry and healthcare they've experienced. So many of the patients that I see have suffered an adverse childhood experience of some sort, whether that's neglect or abuse or, get, or a mixture. And sadly, many have suffered also sexual abuse, either as children or as adults, or quite commonly both, and or also domestic abuse. And there's a lot of similarities, unfortunately, um, between dentistry and what somebody may have experienced. They're having to come in, they're having to lie down, they're having to accept treatment, they're having to have things put in their mouths. They're frightened. They may not feel that they can say stop. And it can trigger many people back to what they have experienced before. Another, I think, really traumatic experience for people is what they may have experienced before in terms of dentistry. So dentists not stopping when they're in pain. When they were children, I think there's... Dentists used to use... Um, 
um, nitrous oxide, so laughing gas, um, anaesthesia, probably quite a long time ago, my parents' generation. And there's a group of people that just say they remember the mask coming and being put on their face, and then they don't remember anything. And um, we don't do that anymore, um, or some dentists do, but it's not routine. Um, but there'll be people that remember that and, and sort of issues with people gagging because of what they may have experienced. And also this judgment, and that will be common across all of healthcare, but certainly people feel judged for even wanting to have a nice smile. They feel they don't deserve one, um, and they feel like dentists think they don't deserve one. And that can be as powerful as well. So what does trauma-informed dentistry involve? So I think it's certainly not a tick, tick box. There's no... Currently, there's no training course or certificate that says, yes, I'm a trauma-informed dentist. Um, I think it's a journey for somebody and also the organisation that I work with. Um, I think it's really important for me to point out here that just because some dentists don't say they're trauma-informed, it does not mean that they're not working in a trauma-informed way. There's many amazing dentists that have worked that work in general practice. I think if you like treating patients who are nervous or phobic, um, you will be working in a trauma-informed way in the special care dentistry services and community dental services. Before doing some of the work that I've done with the communities I work in, I haven't even heard of trauma-informed. And it was only when some of the groups I started working, think, working with started calling me trauma-informed, I thought I'd better do some research on what this is and learned more about the approach. And I think this is probably replicated in medicine as well. I imagine it's very similar. Um, I think I learn all the time, both from the patients I work with and um, from community organisations. I think it's fundamentally strengths-based because of what's happened to some of these patients. The reaction that they're having to dentistry is completely normal. The fact that they've engaged with me either by phone or they've turned up to an appointment shows how much courage that they have and that they can overcome the fear they have about dentistry or enough to be able to have the treatment that they want. I think it's really important to say that the survivor voice or the lived experience is really paramount, and I wish I used that more than I do, and I think I, that's something I really want to develop. Um, moving on to the survivor voice, um, Bristol are running a really interesting collaborative study at the moment based around survivors of childhood sex abuse, um, which is led by Neely, and I'm lucky enough to be involved with that. Um, I think that will be really exciting. Um, and one of the contributors to that is a lady called Sophie Olson, who is the founder of the Flying Child Project. Um, and she's done some amazing work, and she has taken time to liaise and talk to me about dentistry. And I think, based back to what early, I said earlier, some of these quotes that she has written in her blog really describe some of the challenges that people have with dentistry. So what do I feel that trauma-informed dentistry looks like? So I think it starts even before the, before the appointment. Um, I work a lot with social prescribers in Plymouth, um, support organisations, drug and rehab organisations, and um, uh, volunteers at homeless hostels and places like that. And often they are my first contact, not the patient, because of factors that we all know. And building and maintaining a good organisation with those organisations with those groups is really important you know that's where you get your feedback from because you may not necessarily get it from the patient at the time that you're seeing them it's really important to promote a positive attitude to dentistry with those groups because that filters out my organization that i work with has given um sort of oral health ambassador training to many of the support workers that we work with because they're seeing the patients so much more than i do I can just keep reinforcing that message and if you're terrified when you come to a dental appointment, you know, you may not remember all of the things that someone's told you about how to brush your teeth. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it works with the two-way learning. I think the flexibility of the service is really important. COVID actually really taught me a lot about phone conversations before because that's not something I necessarily routinely did, and I do now. Many of my patients are terrified. Getting them in the room, they may not sit in the chair, is the first part, I mean, there's a lot of talking that happens. But I think what's interesting is once somebody is used to coming in and seeing me, they trust me and have, we've done some things, is that then the appointments don't really take that much longer than someone who isn't scared of dentistry. 
Um, I struggle massively with <laughs> arguing and understanding attendance policy with my organisation. I think the default is two strikes and you're out, which doesn't work with the groups of people that I see. But I think I'd, getting the line right is difficult, so I'm always open to suggestions. Um, communication is paramount. I think I've also referenced the amazing Karen Treesman here, is that you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic, and you know it's so important. It applies to all staff members. Um, you know, and I, I know I won't need to really talk about this too much. I think I would like to emphasise that um, I'm really open to talking about mental health with my patients. If somebody is coming in, it's not unusual for a course of treatment to last up to six months and be seeing the patient every two or three weeks. And that appointment could be half an hour or longer. So you really build a relationship with that patient and they can really start to open up to you about things that maybe they don't quite get around to when they see their GP or somebody else. And that can be, you know, I've had disclosures of previous sexual abuse halfway through and then you can signpost for that and it can be really important. Um, and as I said before, it's really normal to want a nice smile. That's not something some, somebody should be embarrassed to ask for. So during the appointment, I think I really emphasise that each patient, it's sort of a problem-solving approach to what they need from me, it, because everybody is so different. What, what is trauma-informed to somebody who's suffered an awful lot of judgment and a dentist that didn't stop? may be very different to trauma-informed for somebody who's previously suffered sexual abuse. And it's problem-solving with each patient. So, I mean, we always take the time the patient will need, um, try and explain everything to the patient, um, and also agree a stop signal. And generally, that's put your hand up, but some people may not feel able to do that. Sometimes it's having the advocate in the room with them and squeezing their hand, and that person will tell me I need to stop. And I always empower my nurse or any support worker who's in surgery to do that. There are some really great resources out there for trauma-informed dentistry. So Dental Fear Central has a piece on it and also Wellbeing Form. And it can be really helpful if you are supporting someone to go to a dentist who maybe does this a little bit less. These things can be really helpful. These um, specific resources from Victim Focus talk about trauma-informed dentistry people that have suffered sexual abuse and they're really helpful. Um, I've written a piece for, along with one of um, a support worker that I work with for the Shame and Medicine Project discussing um, shame sensitive dentistry in a bit more detail and also Luna who runs the Shame and Medicine Project has recently published an article on why trauma informed must be shame sensitive which I think is really brilliant um, so I think when the challenges with trauma-informed dentistry is that um, there is problems with NHS dentistry at the moment. I think it's been, it's been all over the news and the papers, um, and there is a lack of access to dentistry generally. I think you can support your dentists by and commissioning teams to develop models that are better suited for this, um, and Ben is going to come on and talk more about this in just a second. As has been pointed out, we need trauma-informed organisations, not just the dentist. Well-being is really important. I like the model with the bowls running out the water. I personally often feel quite squeezed as the trauma-informed clinician in that you have the pressure from the patients and then also from your organisation. So we need to look after each other. So I've popped all my resources on there, but I'll hand over to Ben now. He's going to talk more about his experiences of this. Fantastic. Hi, um, my name is Ben Atkins. Um, I, until about three year ago, years ago, I owned Revive Dental Care, who is a sunny a practice in sunny Salford. Oh, that's me. I keep these as well. So, until yesterday, we had a fire and it burnt up the town. But that's last life. That's, that's where we where we are. My big passion, I suppose, to give you an idea about me. I had 150 staff. I bought my first practice when I was 24. We had 11 practices. I ran the out of hours from Merseyside, Cheshire and Greater Manchester. So if your patients had toothache, they saw one of my clinicians, probably Christmas Day. I got a phone call Christmas Day, the usual difficult patients, and we've all had those difficult clinician 
clinical journeys through our lives. So what I wanted to do was quickly show you this video here and then continue the lecture if that's okay, if we're going to manage to do that. My name is Abdul and I'm 24. Hi, my name is Anne and I'm 35 years of age. My name is Tony, my age is now 57. And I'm basically on the streets. Can you your tongue out? How do you reach the hard to reach? For dentist Ben Atkins and his team in Manchester, you go to them. Any medical problems that we should be aware of? I'm on methadone. Okay. So what are your thoughts on them? I want them out. We're in a tiny side room at a drop-in centre for homeless people. Oh, you got a bit of a hole in it? Yeah, a hole. We're going out to these sites and we go to a lot of different sites we go to. And then they're shot, we've come to them. You're coming into their environment, we're going to somewhere that they feel safe. Do you have a contact number at all? No. The trick is not just to sign people like Tony up, but then to persuade them to come to the surgery. Tony has lived on the streets for much of his life. He's having his teeth properly cleaned for the first time in years. It's like when you smile, people look at your teeth and they see yellow or whatever, where hopefully now you'll see white. A recent study by the charity Groundswell showed 7% of homeless people had no teeth, 15% had pulled out their own teeth, and more than a quarter hadn't been to the dentist for five years. <laughs> Tony's teeth are done and he's happy. <laughs> But not everyone is so lucky. On a scale of 1 to 10, it's about an 8 out of 10. Really, really painful. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 teeth at the top there. They're all rotted to the stumps, haven't they? Yeah. There must um, be a lot of pain. What I take a methadone, that doesn't help. But when you've got uh, teeth problems and that, because it, it rots your teeth. Ben's Outreach Dentistry is funded by NHS England and is believed to be the only project of its kind in the country. You've seen some examples of today of what I would call Dickensian dentistry, really. There must have been some pain in that journey to get those teeth to that stage. In a rich society like our country, not to be able to care for these people is wrong. Melissa will need 21 of her teeth taking out as Ben continues his mission to reach uh, the hard to reach. Graeme Satchel, BBC Thank News, you. Manchester. Is that OK? Thank you. See you later. So we ran the out of hours, as I said, and that co contract started in about 2009. And we noticed that one of our sites was inundated with homeless patients. We happened to be in the same building as the homeless clinic in Ancoats, and so it was <laughs> obvious that was going to happen, I suppose, but an idiot like a dentist, like me, didn't think of that. So our, we went to our commissioning team in GM, and they were brilliant. Lindsay Bowes and the team there said, look, what do you need to set a clinic up just for half a day a week to try this deal with this population? And they gave us £50,000, which... In a dental budget, majority of my practices are well over a million pounds. It was an absolute drop in the ocean, but it was a start. And with the team there, they, they were absolutely amazing. So we, we evolved that service and we struggled to get people to come to see us, which you guys, I'm sure you've got a couple of patients you'd like to see me to see tomorrow because you'll have that experience. But connecting the dots and connecting systems, especially when we're already in a system, we, we, we talked before about our, the mouth has been taken out of the body at the moment and we've put, been put onto one side and general practice excludes dentists at the moment. It doesn't, there are some amazing projects, we are developing and getting a relationship back again, but it would be really interesting to know if any of you guys knew how to get an NHS dentist. No? I'm guessing no, because most people don't at the moment, because of the newspapers and things. Mm. But how do you get one of your patients who's in acute pain to see a dentist? And that's a real journey in itself. 
we've had difficulties with um, my dental practices actually getting GPs to work with us. We've had instances where some medical practice absolutely amazing, really, really helped. Others, the practice manager wanted to charge us for advertising NHS services. So there are different areas that we work with and it's interesting journeys. Our service really evolved, so we were working closely with all the, the, the shelters, and it was my team that went out. I never did. Well, I went out a couple of times, but you got to use different people. My team were amazing at it. The, the key people in my whole profession, my whole business, were my receptionists, my nurses, and to be fair, keep me way out of it. I should be in the surgery dealing with the patients and actually doing trauma-informed dentistry, as we, we've talked about, not having to phone practices up and trying to chase patients up. So we suddenly, we, were work, we made sure our clinic was on the same day as the methadone clinic downstairs. So we, we were full with patients. We managed our FTAs because we had a, a process for that and everything really worked well. Suddenly, those patients disappeared because the methadone clinic changed days. So we were struggling to get patients into our clinic. We changed that and we put some really good um, processes in place. Now... What I really want to talk about today is where we've got to now and the ability to engage with a discussion point on where you need to be or where we need to be as a society and how we can link in together. So what I'm currently, every time I do a, a presentation, this usually takes about an hour and a half with st strategies in general practice, how you can get practices to engage, use their money as a population management tool and that sort of thing. But what I'm working on at the moment is a project that enables... A charity in Salford, which is amazing by the way, to come to us and say we've got an idea, we, want, we need a dentist, how can we sign post in? Where do we get? So we'd have to keep reinventing the wheel. We're working with over in Leeds, we've now managed to get flex in our general practice contracts, so you get 10% of a couple of practices in Leeds who now totally focus on the homeless, and they've taken our model that we did in Ancoats and now work over in Leeds doing that. But getting commissioners, Public Health England and HEE to line up in the same direction, there's always one cog that drops out and there's a real challenge. So I'd love your input on how we could engage with your unique patients and deal with that. So if you go onto at Dental Ben, that's my Instagram page, you can get direct contact, contact with me for later on on that. So my, you've got multiple different patients who we used to see. Three different groups. One, some patients simply didn't want to see me. They, they didn't. So, but our job for there was signposting. We're there when you need us as a choice, not mean being the all-knowing dentist that I know how to treat your patients because I don't. I don't know the chaotic lives. But my whole team was, we will. We're here for you. And if that sign, sign, signposting message is key, critical to who we are, we've got the some patients who've been through the homeless journey, and they need to get out the other side to restore the smile that is so so valuable. And we're here for that. So my job as a clinician is basically, and some people just want to come and have a chat and have their teeth cleaned. Did you see his smile after he just had a teeth cleaned, which took, what, five minutes? And he gave him such confidence and a smile. It's nothing to me, but to him. It, so it's me understanding what that patient wants and my team understanding what that patient wants and us simply giving it. But engaging that, it built such a community and then you got advocates and it really snowballed especially the work if you need any information on dentistry look at the groundswell project they, they did an amazing project in london so by engaging the patients we got a lot of patients to complete their treatment and it was a really successful journey some didn't but they came back later on they knew where we were so realistically it's a really short two minute thing but dentistry is really complicated it's not really, we just do teeth. But it's just, it's finding the patients. Dentistry is really simple if you give your time for your patients and listen to people. I don't think I'm gonna talk much more. I think got, that's, about, that's about me, so there we go. Thank you. Are there any questions for us that anyone has about, could be about dentistry in general or trauma-informed dentistry? No. Well, thank you. Thank you. And do come and talk to us at the end if you'd like to. You're legging it too quickly there. Run away.
to get in spaces within surgeries as well, um, which I know is not just an Oldham issue, it's across the board. I was just wondering if you had sort of any tips for that really, because I we work with people for quite a while to engage them and get them involved in services and then you get them to that point where they're like, yes, we really want to do it, but then you can't come in or I was just wondering if you had any tips or advice or anything or if you know of anything that's up and coming or whatever. <laughs> Um, I might let Ben answer that from okay. the Manchester no, no side. No, um, <laughs> yeah. for, for, no. no. I think for me, the people that control dentistry are the dental practice managers. So speak to the practice managers in those locations. There's not going to be that many patients, is there? You know, um, if I said I could give you 50 slots, that would probably give you quite a good run at it until you've got it. That's not many patients. Or you've, the people to contact is probably the local dental committee, LDC. You've got my email and you can deal with that. I, I can help out and try and find that journey because for me it was the problem having the patients turn up yeah. it was for you having a place to take the patients to and you'll get those patients because they've got a relationship with you I don't want my team going out to the, the shelters the Samaritans to actually do the marketing I want my team in the surgery and you manage the patients for me that symbiotic journey means I can get your patients into a general normal practice we don't need to reinvent the wheels here just signposting and conversation. So my biggest advice is get a list of all the practices, find out who are the practice managers, and they run it. Ignore the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, in terms of, do you, were you finding you're facing barriers to coming in to the dental surgeries as well? Was that... On the day they might not turn up and then it's like oh. but um it's yeah getting a space in the first place is one of those barriers but then i suppose the other side of it is that understanding as well that they might not i might turn up the first time or i might you know try and pick them up but actually they're not answering the door to me even though i know they're there but i will get them there so it, it's that mm. two-sided but at the moment in oldham it's just actually getting yeah a space to be honest yeah, just can't get a, an NHS. I think the space. other, it, um, the other factor you could look at is kind of your community dental services, and some places will have a non-professional referral for that. Especially if you can write about social fa barriers that they face if you're not getting any luck with your general dental practitioner, because sadly, the dentist won't be paid anything if the patient doesn't turn up. So it's really difficult where there's. So it, we work on quite different models. So I'm a salaried dentist, so I do get paid if my patient doesn't turn up, which means I can be a bit more flexible if you've got somebody who misses a lot of the time. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Well, you, um, my email address is on the slides, but if anyone wants it at the end, do come and ask. Thank you.